I'm Nick Jimenez, and this is the Cigar Snob Podcast. If you shop at brick-and-mortar tobacconists, you're almost certainly in contact with loads of Eduardo Fernandez's tobacco, whether you like it or not. One of the most prolific growers of premium cigar tobacco in Nicaragua, Eduardo came into the cigar business by an unconventional path. We'll get into that in a little bit. His agricultural conglomerate, Aganorsa, includes its tobacco growing operation and his cigar manufacturing business. The Aganorsa factory, which has been known until now as Tabacos Valle de Jalapa, or TABSA, makes cigars for Eduardo's own Casa Fernandez brand, as well as JFR, Foundation, Illusioni, Warped, Viaje, and HVC, among other brands. Eduardo sat down with me for an interview not too long ago at his factory. We talked about his past ventures, how he built his tobacco empire, and what he sees in the factory's future. Before we get into that interview, though, a word from this episode's sponsor, Safra Rum. At Cigar Snob Magazine, we know that man cannot live on water alone, which is why we keep a healthy stockpile of Safra Rum at the office. I'm Nick Jimenez, Senior Editor of Cigar Snob Magazine, and I'm here to tell you that every time we crack open a bottle of Safra Rum, we are impressed. In fact, I'm kind of hydrating with Safra Rum right now. It's unlike anything else, in part because of Safra's small batch approach. They use only hand-cut sugarcane and process it into top-grade molasses, distill in column stills, and ferment in a proprietary locally grown yeast. The rum master then ages the virgin rum in carefully selected bourbon oak casks. The end result is a rum masterpiece that's great for top shelf cocktails, drinking it on the rocks, or even just drinking it neat, which, by the way, is what we did when we paired this in the pages of Cigar Snob magazine with the Oliva Serie B Melanio, but it goes great with just about any cigar. Here's what we had to say about Safra rum. Quote, the rum introduces smooth, honey, caramel, and molasses flavors that start to complement the coffee, chocolate, and spice from the cigar. Safra also received an exceptional 95-point rating from the Beverage Tasting Institute, so we are not the only ones who are crazy about this stuff. It's just another one of their prestigious awards. Ask for Safra Rum at your favorite retailer, restaurant, or bar. Make sure you follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Safra Rum. That's Z-A-F-R-A Rum. Safra Rum. Always drink responsibly and remember that there is no rum without Safra. All right, and with that, let's jump into my interview with Eduardo Fernandez. I think that your your pre tobacco history is is a little bit different from from other people. So, just for for the person who hasn't uh, kind of gotten into your story, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, how it was, what the path for you was into the tobacco business, going through all of the the banking and uh, and how you decide, okay, this is what I want to to do and commit mm-hmm. to. I came from Cuba when I was 10 years old as a political refugee in 1960 uh, uh, without my parents. And I was raised uh, initially by my uh, my uncles. They later came. And uh, we settled in Fort Lauderdale, not in Miami exactly, so we were more immersed in the uh, American culture. From there, I proceeded to go to private school in Connecticut, boarding school that gave me a great education. There, funny enough, and unbeknownst to me, I was right next to the Connecticut Valley. So often I would see the buses of uh, tobacco pickers, mostly Puerto Ricans, uh, go into the fields in Suffield, Windsor, et cetera, Enfield to pick tobacco. Little did I know at that time, I was 14 to 17 years old, that that would be my life's calling down the road. Right. But uh, that was my first introduction into tobacco. No? Apart from Cuba, where my uncles would smoke, et cetera, and I would you know, feel that aroma in the room of uh, the special uh, Cuban tobacco has. Mm-hmm. No? So that's how I began. Then I went to pre- uh, university. I went to study uh, finance at the Wharton School, which is a very good uh, university in Philadelphia. From there, I graduated. And at that time, they would hire you directly from school. And I ended up in New York in international banking because it seemed like the upcoming field of uh, international trade, growing, etc. cetera. My, my speaking Spanish and uh, all that uh, was entering a, a, new, a new job. Uh, I lived 10 years in New York and, and worked in international banking. I, they transferred me down to Miami uh, to open the, the, a branch there. And I, I lived six years in Miami uh, in Brickell and the international banking scene. 
And there was, a, again, an immersion into Cuban culture. At the beginning, it was sort of a shock to me. I lived in a neighborhood there that's called Coconut Grove, for people who know it. It's a little bit more bohemian next to the boats and the sea, etc., and had more of a, it was an ambience. more it was bohemian not, at the time. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, even more so. So that uh, seemed to, to settle me better because it was a, it was a shock for me coming uh, so many years away from, uh, to Miami. And there, uh, from early on in life, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to, to do something on my own, not be working for somebody else. Uh, but it's very hard, you know, you go to the best schools, you study, you do well in, in whatever you do, but you're a professional. And uh, to start your own business, you need to, do, to know how to do something, apart from working for somebody or being a, a technical person. Secondly, you need working capital investment that I didn't have. I, I came from a, uh, the Cuban experience took everything away from us and uh, my parents just were able to give me a very good education. No? The rest was up to me. But I always had that inkling. No? And uh, I, I spent 17 years in banking and uh, I was always looking for something outside. Uh, being a very conservative person, I had to make sure if, when I did that, that it would be successful. No? Funny enough, as life often happens, you see opportunities come about and you have to grab them, no? So we saw, me and my brother, an opportunity in Spain. We had lived, uh, we started working when we were 16 at that time in the U.S. Yeah, you worked part-time uh, as early as 16, you know, either busboy, waiter, or whatever, no? So we were always working in, in that field. And we had seen from early on Burger King, McDonald's, and Pizza Hut, and all these uh, appear in the scene in Miami, Fort Lauderdale area, no? When I lived in New York, I used to eat a lot of pizza because there was a, almost a pizza in every corner. We always eat a slice. And uh, opportunity arose in Spain that it was just the fast food industry was just beginning. You know? Spain at that time and still is, is a very traditional, excellent food experience. Uh, but fast food was just appearing. You know? So we seized the opportunity and uh, I felt like uh, Hernan Cortez. I burned my, my ships and sold my house. I lived in Pinecrest, which was an upcoming area, and a very good school district. Sold my car, everything, and I went to open a pizzeria in Spain, in Madrid. And everybody, Already this is very different from most people's story of how they end up in tobacco. Right, right. Yes. I opened a <laughs> pizzeria an, in oh, Spain. Oh, you can cut this out of me. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is, this is okay. great. Yeah. And luckily enough, from the first pizzeria, it was a success, you know. It was like uh, the golden egg started hatching. And from there, we grew to 300 pizzerias in, in a 10-year period. And this was uh, Telepizza? Telepizza. And it, there's even a, a Harbor, uh, Harvard uh, case written about the success and how unique we were in, in, in doing that. No? Yeah, this sort of introduces Spain to pizza delivery. Yeah, pizza delivery. We were a huge success. Uh, even against Domino's and pizza, we beat the hell out of them. Yeah. They all came, you know, thinking big and that they could conquer us and they were just not able to. Still, the, 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 the business exists. Yeah, I've had, I've had Telepizza. Right. Yeah. And uh, we, I learned marketing there, working. Uh, we used to work 16, 17 hours a day because everything happened very quickly, you know. Thank God in the sense that we were able to be successful as well, no? But I didn't want to be a pizza man my whole life, you know? So the opportunity arose that we went in the stock market and uh, we were able to sell at a very good price. And uh, I settled into the financial world, no? uh, initial retirement. But I felt bored right away. I'd moved to London, uh, lived the life. I was very culturally minded as well, thinking also of my kids' education that'd be the best, just as I had received the best as well. Your kids is always your best crop, apart from anything else, no? and it's, uh, it's lasting. No? Uh, but I was bored. I didn't have. Uh, Tired of reading the Financial Times and following the stock market and all that. I said, well, what do you want to do, Eduardo, for the rest of your life? I was 48. Uh, and I had always liked farming from early on. When I was a young kid, I used to cut grass and, and plant trees and have a little nursery, this and that. I even had looked at that business early on in Davie, outside of Fort Lauderdale. So I decided to do that. I'm always long-range planning. And I said, well, I can do this now for the rest of my life and truly enjoy it and, and, and live that life. Because I also like working with peasants and, and the land and nature. So I came down here to Costa Rica and Nicaragua. And unbeknownst to me, I'd always had a great image of Costa Rica. That's a great country, democracy, uh, developed uh, to a large extent, nature, this and that. But I didn't, the, the country just didn't speak to me. Yeah. And, and so this is, a, this is about what year? This was 93. I hadn't sold yet, but I always think ahead. 
I was already planning to, and uh, and uh, I found Nicaragua uh, extremely attractive. I'm an island person, and unbeknownst to me, again, I'd always been close to the ocean. I lived in Philadelphia, I lived in New York, I lived in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and obviously I was born in an island. Uh, when I lived in Spain, in Madrid, it's four hours away, the ocean, and that distance, I felt it was like a choking feeling that I was away from the, the sea. So I was conscious that I had to be close to the sea for the rest of my life. In Costa Rica, living in San Jose is like five, six hour drive through beautiful mountains, but to get to the sea is a bit of a distance. Well, Nicaragua, within an hour, I could be uh, uh, at the ocean. So that was an attraction to me as well. And Nicaraguans are very friendly people, very open. Costa Ricans are a little bit more aloof, uh, more enclosed, uh, because they're mountain people. And mountain people in itself are more reserved. So I found Nicaragua very much to my liking. Having lived uh, already... Uh, 38 years outside of my home country, I was always a foreigner somewhere else. You know? uh, I found that Nicaragua was very receptive. They needed the country to be rebuilt. They needed investors, and uh, they're very extremely receptive people and open. And funny enough, there always has been an interchange between Nicaragua and Cuba, uh, partially political, but the way things are. You know, a lot of Cubans came here. They had literacy uh, campaigns. They were teachers, doctors obviously a lot of military, etc., And a lot of Nicaraguans went to Cuba. And some spent like 13, 15 years because they didn't have money to come back. So they would stay there in boarding school. Uh, all the military there was trained as well in Cuba. So there was a very good rapport. And then on the other side of the political coin with Miami, uh, in 1980, a lot of Nicaraguans landed there as well. And they were in banking, etc. and I made a lot of friends. So all those things coming into play were attractive to me. Uh, the vibrations were right. right. So I chose Nicaragua. Uh, I was looking at agricultural projects, so I came here and, and uh, traveled the whole country. Because when you want to get involved in something, you want to make something that is very good. And you have to have the components that are there, you know? And agriculture as well, you know? Uh, you know, you can't plant certain things here as well as you can't plant them in the United States, depending on weather, nature, the soil conditions, etc. And when I did my survey, which was quite extensive, I came up to Esteli, and I met uh, with Nestor Plasencia. It was at the, uh, close to the end of the boom. So he was very receptive. He said that tobacco was, you know, a great business and that. And he introduced me uh, that, you know, first, it is very Cubanesque. Secondly, that the soils of Nicaragua were first class in that regard. And that to me was very important because when you do something, you invest all your time and effort you want to make sure you have the right components. And in something like tobacco, the soil is extremely important and the climate as well, no? And then the, the know-how of the people. No? And, and so at, at this point, what did the, uh, the learning curve look like for you? Because at, you, know, you sort of come from uh, investing in all these other sectors and now you're doing this extensive survey. Uh, so what was the process for you like of, of picking up the knowledge that you needed to do that survey in a way that, that you could process the information yourself. All businesses are run by people. You can have all the money in the world, you can have the best ideas, you can have the best location, you can have the best land. But if you don't have the right person, you got nothing. So I had learned that early on in business from day one. And your destiny, you have to control. You cannot outsource the important elements of a product or a concept that you're developing. You have to do it yourself. So, and I'm not one to steal people from other places, especially in a small country like this. So I went back to the source. The source was Cuba and the source was Vuelta Abajo. So I went to Vuelta Abajo. First time I returned to Cuba 40 years after leaving uh, as a child, I never went back. So in the year 2000, uh, 99, 2000, I went to Cuba several times to search for these people. In Vuelta Abajo, there are two little towns, San Luis and San Juan. That's where the best tobacco is grown, and that's where the, the Cuban history and culture of tobacco is, is there, okay? The rest of Cuba, they plant tobacco, but when they do that, they take people from these towns to take their, the, the, the Cuban tobacco culture there because the knowledge that's garnered three, 400 years uh, is not learned in a book and is not learned in a, in a one-year process. You have to go through many storms, many situations to know the ins and outs of tobacco. It's a life learning process. In one of these trips, I, I met Robaina, 
because uh, one of my top men was extremely friendly with him. And we went to his farm around 6.30, I'll never forget, in the evening. And we couldn't find him. His farm is very small. It's like an acre and a half. It's like a garden. And he was inside the tobaccos by himself, looking at certain leaves hanging on the kuhe. And Arsenio, you know, they hugged each other, said, what are you doing, uh, you know, Rowena? And he said, no, this year I tried something new. And that struck to me. Uh, and he was already 80 plus, world famous, this and that. And the fellow was still tinkering, still trying to come out with a better leaf, a better product, you know. Uh, and that was, you know, a key moment in my learning experience that you never stop learning, you never stop trying, you never stop trying to perfect what you're trying to seek. It's extremely important. Uh, it's a life learning process. It takes about 10 years to capture and dominate a subject. Yeah. Even, you know, a simple one. Never mind tobacco. Right. So all those things come into play. So I hired uh, older Cubans that uh, grew cover leaf. Cover leaf is like the major leagues. It's like playing for the Yankees. Uh, it's special. You have to succeed every year, otherwise you don't repeat the process. To grow uh, short leaf uh, for short filler, etc., is is more common. But in able to be able to succeed uh, growing cover leaf, you have to be very very good. So I hired some of those people and brought them here. I was lucky, okay, to find great people in Cuba. One in particular, Arsenio Ramos. He's a giant. Just like Pedro Martin was a, uh, was a giant, he's now deceased. Arsenio Ramos is an encyclopedia of tobacco. His palate is incredible. He used to run in Pinal del Rio all the fermentation process, the cohiba, everything. He was the boss. And he had 40 some plus years experience. I brought him here when he retired. And I listened to him. I learned a lot from him. I listened to people, especially uh, people with wisdom and age, and in tobacco even more so. So he was a, a great mentor and continues to be. Uh, he's an incredible individual, self-taught. I don't think he had a great education, but he writes beautifully. Uh, uh, a great lover of tobacco, a true believer in it. So he, he was a great mentor. No? I have Jacinto Iglesias is here. He came on early on. All the Cubans now have been with me 20 years, the yeah. time we've been. Uh, he runs the operation. He, I hired him from Cuba as a sanitary engineer in tobacco. His specialty was diseases and all of that. But he showed great management talent. And even though he came from the communist system and non-capitalism, he's the biggest capitalist. <laughs> he watches his pennies, he drives the people, and he controls uh, costs, negotiates. He does everything. He's a natural in that regard. And I have great trust in him, and he's proven that way uh, as well. I started early because in business, from my perspective, first you crawl, then you walk, and then you run. It's a process you can't skip, otherwise it comes back to haunt you. And tobacco even more so. So I initially started just plodding around. The first year I financed. As I explained to you earlier, I found out that financing was not the way. Because the people who grew the tobacco grew it uh, seeking return, weight. They weren't worried about quality. And the person that you thought was a farmer, all of a sudden you, thought, you found that he was just a, a middleman. That he hired somebody else to, to plant the crop. And that was not to my liking. So immediately I changed the process. I said, you, you have to control your destiny. You have to grow your own tobacco. You have to be vertically integrated. It's extremely important from my vision and my perspective that you have to have vertical integration. 300 hands and a little more touch the tobacco from seed to ash. All those elements are extremely important. Anything you do wrong, the tobacco is never the same quality, and you cannot fix it. It's not like a machine. It's not something that you can redo. It's lost, the quality. It still has sale. You can still do things with it, but you should not use it in a premium cigar. So I grew immediately conscious to that effect. And then by happenstance, uh, there's an element of luck in business. No matter how good you are, no matter all that you have, you have to have an element of luck. Remember reading Napoleon when they brought a new general or somebody that was a good candidate, 
He said, is he lucky? Luck is an element which is being at the right place, the right time, the right situation where things happen. Sometimes you can have a company, let's say Kodak, out of the sky, new technology comes about and they don't survive, Xerox. A lot of companies in the world don't survive by outside elements. Partially mistakes they make, but new horizons, new things that come about that are not in control by you right. and you're wiped out. No matter if you had, you know, Kodak was like Coca-Cola. Every quarter you had a Kodak sign. Now you don't see them. It just basically disappeared. So I was very conscious of that, that uh, luck is an extremely important element. The, I call it the stars have to line up. When those stars line up, man, you kick ass. You have to see that opportunity. You have to see it happening. There's a small little book called the, the, the E Factor, I think it's called, and it's the entrepreneur. You have to see forward and see where you're going to go and what you're going to do in order and then you go for it. And people will say, no, that's not possible. That's, that can't be done. But you have a unique vision. And that's mm -hmm. the fellow from IBM, from Microsoft, from Google, all these people that have created something, Apple. They saw that something could be done and that nobody had seen it before or nobody believed that it could be done. And along the way, people say, it can't be done. I learned in Spain, uh, Europeans have that factor, is it can't be done. America taught me that it can be done. To me, it was extremely important, even growing my kids, that they have the American can-do spirit. That's what makes things happen. Other people know it can't be done. The wall is there. Nobody's done that before. Bullshit. You find a way, you know? Obviously, there are certain things in life that can't be done. Yeah, and you find out that along the way. Yeah, but, but you don't most start things from that can premise. be done. Yeah. You just have to find the way. And with determination, persistence, and that vision, and hard work, a lot of hard work, you get there. So that's the kind of opportunity that you saw in tobacco. In tobacco here. And the stars started lining up. The boom ended just as I was entering, unbeknownst to me. Uh, one of those stars was a little bit out of alignment. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I was still very small. I was just crawling. Yeah. But opportunity came about. One of the biggest land holdings, which was the cooperatives that kept some of the best lands when they, they had to give back land to, to the people that came back to uh, reclaim their farm. They didn't get their farm. They got somebody else's, etc. And these huge cooperatives, both in Condega, Jalapa, and Esteli, uh, kept what they thought best. In the boom uh, and the bust, they basically, unfortunately, were wiped out. You know? Their competitors, et cetera, says it was a bit of a payback time and says this is an opportunity to buy. And they were on strike. And I was next to them in Jalapa, and I seen all these guys with signs in their, in, in, in their farms. And I didn't know, you know what was happening. You know, it was just, uh, and I started finding out, and I found out they were on strike. They hadn't been paid for a year. Uh, because they were run by their own, you know, senior people. And they kept saying, you know, the tobacco's going to get sold, this and that, we'll pay your wages. And they worked, uh, you know, these are very poor farmers. Nicaragua is the second poorest country in, in South America. Uh, they, uh, you know, were living basically, you know, uh, hand to mouth. So I stepped in. People told me, these people are not trustworthy. These people play around you, this and that. So I planted the first year, uh, the first part was corn, over a thousand acres. I gave them the money and everything worked perfectly. And I said, that told me I could work with them. I didn't have the land. I didn't have the smoke, you know, the dry houses and, and a lot of the agriculture and the irrigation at that time because I was just beginning. Again, I was just crawling. So I told myself, Eduardo, this is a golden opportunity. Tobacco requires specific lands and infrastructure. And if they've been planting for 30, 40 years, that tells you that those lands are good because the process has been repeated. When I arrived here, they were planting in Leon, which was a total disaster and mistake. Why? The land was very good. It was volcanic, the best in Nicaragua, but it was very thin. Wind and the soil, the sand, got into the tobacco. There was a huge project of cover leaf and it was a disaster after, after a couple of years because tobacco requires a, a lot of elements. Like I told you before, the first Cubans planted in Sebaco uh, in 1960. And after one year, 
they found out there was too much wind. The leaves would break and the stems would uh, uh, move somewhat and the root ball would suffer accordingly. So tobacco requires excellent land for tobacco and many other conditions and also labor force, trained uh, labor force and plentiful. And the water, the vegas, the irrigation and all that. So it was a, a large undertaking for me and I wasn't, to tell you the truth, ready for it. But it was an, an opportunity once in a lifetime. Yep. So I, I thought about it and I says, are you in this for the long haul? Are you in the, for the short haul? This is an opportunity that's not going to repeat itself. In, in life, that's the way things are. You're lucky to be presented them, lucky to see them. And then you have to decide, do I take it? Do I take the risk? Do I jump in? Or do I let it pass? So that situation happened to me in front of my eyes with tobacco, and I jumped into it. So I went to Cuba and hired uh, these people because I didn't have the, the technical labor force. No? And that's how it all began. I jumped from small to big as grower because that was my initial interest. I came into the tobacco business from the agricultural, the growing side. As time went on, in a few years, people would come and see my crop, see my leaves. And they said, we want you to make cigars for us. I said, that's not my part and parcel of what I'm doing. I'm just totally dedicated to the leaf side. And, some, and about when do you start getting those sorts of inquiries from people? About, about three know. years after I started, especially when the, the, all, all my land acquisition and the, the volume of tobacco I had. The problem in tobacco is you have to have consistency year in, year out to make blends. The sourcing of tobacco and, and the volume is extremely important if you're going to do something uh, big and, and, and top quality. So I had those ingredients, and that's what they saw. That's why they said, we need your cover leaf. We don't want you to sell it to someone else and let someone else make our cigars. We want you to make our cigars because we want your source and your quality year in, year out. Yeah. So they kind of forced me into that, funny enough, because of the cover leaf angle. And then there was a, an elderly fellow that was a true gentleman and very knowledgeable, one of the giants of tobacco. His name was Pedro Martin. He was a leaf broker and he also owned Tropical Tobacco. And he came from way back in Cuba. And he came with an American company in the 60s. And one of the first things, that he, the first job he had was to source tobacco in the world to replace the Cuban blends because they were foreseeing that Cuban tobacco was not to be used. So his knowledge, you know, we, uh, I met him at 80 years old, was, you know, the best you can imagine. He had an extremely fine palate and knew everything about tobacco that was to be known. Um, so he was a bit of a, my mentor in that sense. And he saw my fields and this and that, and he was amazed, you know, that uh, Havana could be grown in that quantity and in Nicaragua with that flavor and that taste. He was soon to retire, unbeknownst to me. And one day he called me and says, Eduardo, I want you to buy my company. I said, but Pedro, you know I'm not in tobacco. He says, you're the man to run my company. You're, you have the source. You have the best tobacco for me uh, of a Havano. I want you to, you know, I'm going to give you the company in very good terms, etc. I says, I don't have the person. I'm totally involved in Nicaragua, as I still am, because the land and the growing and the fermentation and now the factory require my full attention. Tobacco is very detail-oriented. Any detail that's not correct pays back pays back in the wrong way. And there's no way, as I told you before, to fix it. So I found somebody who was a uh, first cousin of mine to run that operation and I still stuck here. So I acquired Tropical and uh, we started in, in the US uh, in the uh, distribution and, and selling of tobacco. Because of my European experience, I, I also had a company in Spain and in Germany. So we were one of the first to enter that market because they were just totally Cuban. But our tobacco is very Cuban-like. Our blending, our techniques, our flavor is very Cuban-like. Jalapa is the closest thing in the world to Huel Tabajo. Not Cuba, Huel Tabajo. Right. They grow tobacco in different parts of Cuba, but it's not the same, okay? It's not the island that makes it. It's not the Cuban, okay? It's a particular Cuban from Huel Tabajo, where his father, where his grandfather, where his great-grandfather perhaps lived in the same house, and all they talk is about tobacco until the day they die. They have a huge respect and love for the leaf. 
So as I sensed that, I said, that's what I want, you know, for, for us to have as well. So that's why I brought, you know, those people. And that's uh, my vision grew to do things the old fashioned way. I don't experiment with new tobacco or new flavors. New is to do what was done for hundreds of years in Cuba. If I can do that, I'm the happiest man in the world. Sure. So my vision of the company, my vision of our tobacco is to do things as they were done. When the first Cubans came, I could hear them because Cubans are very proud, as you know, being one yourself. They would speak in low terms and say, this was the way it was done before in capitalist times. In business, as you know, time is money. It costs. The time you keep the tobacco, the things you do to it cost money, a lot of money, because it's not in and out. You don't have the tobacco leaf. It takes years to uh, ferment, and uh, obviously the planting season and all that, and then to make it into a great cigar. You have to give that time. The tobacco is the one that rules. He speaks to you. You have to learn to listen to him. He tells you what he needs at a particular time. You cannot rush the leaf. You cannot rush the fermentation. We're extremely careful in that regard. There's an element of humidity that you have to add on. We add that least amount possible at the latest point. We let the tobacco do its own thing. And when we do add a little bit of humidity, we do it very carefully. Again, because people do it at times to rush it, to push it, but you leave taste and flavor a little bit behind. Yeah. So we're very careful to let the tobacco speak, to do things that should be done and uh, do things the right way. Because if they're done the wrong way, it pays back. It's not the same flavor, it's not the same. Often people say that our tobacco is different. Why is it different? Terrence, who just came on board, was the first question he asked me. Why is your tobacco different? Obviously, he's a great smoker and has been in the, in the business for a long time. And I said, I guess it's the way we do things. It's the seeds we use. It's the land we have. It's the human element of the Guajiro involved. So our tobacco speaks for itself. I even dared uh, name it Aganorsa, which is our company. We sell Aganorsa leaf. Okay, we don't sell tobacco leaf. It has a personality, it has a name, it has a, uh, a backing to it, a culture behind it, a vision. To us, it's, it's extremely important. And we never stop learning. The field took time to, to regain their brilliance. We give the land everything that it requires. It costs money again, but you have to do it because the payback is there. So we don't sacrifice anything for quality. We give the time and everything that's required and no cutting of corners. Extremely important from my perspective that everything that the tobacco requires at every step of the way, it's done correctly. What is not, then it doesn't come into this factor. Sure. So when, um, especially for the person who maybe hasn't had uh, the opportunity to smoke a lot of your cigars, how would you characterize uh, the, the cigar your own personal cigar sensibility and, and, and the way that that comes through in the product? And when did you sort of settle into uh, that as like, this is the sort of cigar that we make? Obviously, a lot of it has to do with the tobacco that you're growing, but there are, there are other elements there too. Uh, okay, extremely important that we haven't spoken about is the seeds, yeah. okay? We went back to Cuba and got the two most famous uh, seeds from Cuba, which are Criollo and Corojo. Uh, because of the blue mold and, and other elements, uh, these seeds took time to redevelop. The old Criollo and the old Corojo disappeared because new diseases came in the 80s and just wiped the crop out in Cuba and here as well. And Cuba, in order to develop new seeds, took a long time because it's not a one, two step situation, you know, through crossbreeding and this and that, to come back to the truest origin of the Criollo and the Corojo. But with the resistance, to certain diseases that had come on the horizon and that were decimating the tobacco crops. So that to us was extremely important. We brought those two seeds here and we still are the two major the seeds that we plant. We believe it's specifically each brings a different component to the tobacco that to us is very important. 
the criollo uh, brings a, 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 a little bit more strength, a little bit more of spices. Uh, it has its own characteristics. The corojo is more subtle. It has the strength, but it's more subtle. It creeps into you. You have to smoke the cigar and then you really feel it. But it's not up front. It's not peppery. In fact, it's sweet. It adds an element of sweetness to the tobacco. And that combination of both make our tobacco different to begin with. Then the human element, the soil that I spoke about, and then lastly, the fermentation. And not cutting corners and doing things right. Because flavor and taste to us is the most important factor in the tobacco. We're always smoking the leaf. That leaf is the way it expresses and speaks to us. And we have to listen, okay? And you listen through here. Uh, the sensory perception that you receive from the tobacco leaf tells you if you have the great quality of leaf. And then the blending comes into play where you play with those leaves. And it's incredible the amount of blends. It's never ending. When you interplay with them, with the regions, the farms, we even split by lot. In the same farm, we have different lots because they smoke differently. And we're so cognizant of that, that we're very selective as to what we're seeking. And we find it and we use it, okay? So again, the tobacco speaks to you. You have to listen and you have to pay attention and then follow your instinct. So to us, as I explained to you earlier, what we want is a great Havana, the old one, okay? We don't want to experiment with new things. It's go back to the traditional, to the true aroma and flavor of a Cuban light cigar. And we're able to do that uh, in Nicaragua with the great soils we have, with the Cubans and with the Cuban seed and with our methods that are strictly uh, Cuban. In fact, Cuba now doesn't do things as they used to. They cut corners. You know, they have to produce a lot of tobacco. Uh, they have problems, you know, different system, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, there's a difference. And that's why Nicaragua, Honduras, and Dominican are, are gaining in, in that regard, no? Again, Vuelta Bajo is unique. The location, the soil, the people cannot be reproduced anywhere else in the world, okay? It has a unique flavor and taste that cannot be taken away from it. Has, I'm Cuban to begin with, and I'm proud of that, and I respect it, no? But in Nicaragua and Jalapa and Esteli, we're able to uh, uh, do something uh, similar in that regard. Nicaragua is the closest thing to Cuba. I don't know if geographically, a million years ago, Jalapa was connected somehow or some way because uh, they get there, they see the soil, etc., and they're surprised, you know, uh, how close it is to Vuelta Bajo. So I always planted tobacco. I don't have contracts. I just worry of having good leaf. My biggest competitor is myself. I don't look what the competition is doing. I just worry about that leaf that I'm producing and those blends that I'm making. That to me is everything. I'm not looking over somebody's shoulder. I'm looking at me. Day in, day out, that things are done the proper way. So I don't know much about what other people do. I just know what I do and what other people that come here uh, and their vision and we make it happen. That to me is, is key and it's always been in business. When I started planting, people thought that's crazy. First, I didn't come from the tobacco side. Second, I started planting, uh, you know, at a time almost a, a thousand acres and said, where is all this tobacco growing? Everybody was worried, you know, this is a very close-knit community and uh, uh, like I say, people uh, grow under contract and they have customers. I didn't have customers, but that didn't worry me. What worried me was producing great tobacco and people will beat a path to your door. It took a while, but that path is there when people keep coming back. I even let the little guys buy. Some people say, no, my tobacco is contracted out. But some little people become big people. Yep. So I give, you know, my tobacco to, you know, uh, and let anybody come in and, and buy tobacco from me as long as I have it. Uh, I have certain commitments, but they're not contracts. I don't have a contract with the big people that buy from me. Why? 
because I'm sure that my product will get sold, and it does. Uh, so I, from the beginning, had a very different perspective on growing tobacco. There were tall tale stories that my tobacco was going to go to Cuba, that this, that that, because it was such a huge amount. Who was going to use this tobacco? That didn't worry me at all. Luckily, I had uh, long pockets and determination and resistance to weather the storm yeah. uh, and survive it and, and, uh, and, and become better. And that's how it occurred. So talk a little bit about the, the end product and in terms of what are some of the, the brands that you remember, you know, uh, was there, is it, does a brand come to mind that when it finally went to market, you thought, okay, we, we've hit our stride on the cigar making side? Okay, it's, it's multiple because uh, we also make cigars for other people, right. private labels. Uh, to us, are just as extremely important. What comes here and the effort and the dedication that is, is given to any cigar made here is the same. The leaves are used the same way. We don't discern and say, this is only for us. Okay, what comes into this factory and is made, is made with the same dedication, the same leaf, the same quality. When the blend is made, all those things are taken into consideration just as well. <laughs> Certain people, one in particular, Dion, that has been with us for a very long time, has uh, an incredible uh, palate, also his own vision, his own taste. He's taught us a lot, the synergy of uh, some of these uh, very knowledgeable people that have their own vision. They're uh, entrepreneurs uh, themselves, have been a great help. That's how things are, you know, come together and something even more beautiful comes about. Right. So all those things have helped in that process. You know, that uh, we developed the Casa Fernandez labels yeah, we opened a little factory in, 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 uh, in Miami with Cuban rollers, uh, and we do special craft things there that are also high quality, no? Some of those just uh, recognized by you, uh, Aniversario, no? Now we came out with the Guardian. Uh, again, that's great tobacco. The last two years, we've had incredibly uh, tremendous harvest. Every year, like I say, we continue learning we continue getting better. It's a never-ending process. Tobacco is something else I learned from the Cubans. You're 80 plus and you're still in tobacco. You die with your boots on. I've never seen that in another industry. That's the way Pedro Martin was. That's the way the farmers are. And they always talk about tobacco. It, it grabs you, it just doesn't let you go. It's unique in that regard versus uh, doing something else. Yep. I imagine wine perhaps is somewhat similar in that regard, uh, but uh, tobacco from that sense surprised me uh, what it takes and how it, it grabs you that it just doesn't let you go. Sure. <clears throat> so you brought up some of the, the people that you do, uh, that you make cigars for, Dion, Melillo, uh, mm -hmm. Vignette. Um, yeah, Kyle Warp, Melillo. Yeah. We have a few of that, that are doing you know great things with our leaf. I love people to take our leaf and do something with their own vision. Because that to me is a wonder. You know, I, I take pleasure in, in people making our leaf even more beautiful, even more expressive. That to me is an accolade. So I, I, I take as much pride in making anybody cigar here or that our leaf participates in their blend. Yeah, is, is there something that, uh, that you look for in, in those people who you work with? Uh, is, is there something that maybe all of these people have in common that makes them a good fit for working with you and, uh, and the way that you think well, about Well, it's a little bit trial and error. We always give everybody an opportunity. People prove themselves in the arena, the fighting arena, which is the marketplace. With their vision, we make the best cigar in their profile. Okay, We listen to them. What do you want? You know, they're owners of their own brands. So we placate them or do what they want in that sense, you know. Uh, some take that opportunity and, and, you know, take it to another level with their vision. And to me, that's a, a great sense of pride and accomplishment because I'm not the only guy in the world that knows how to do something well, you know, far from it. Other people bring a lot to the table. And to me, that's extremely important. Uh, those people prove themselves. When they first walk in, you don't know. But in time, the marketplace proves it for you. Sure. And that, to me, is the final proof. Yeah. Uh, at what point 
sort of backtracking a little bit, you know, when you were talking about the tobacco speaking to you and uh, at what point in this whole journey do you find yourself talking like a tobacco man, <laughs> right? Because the, the mozzarella wasn't speaking to you. No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> it doesn't tell you the temperature. No, back then we used to say put yeah. tomato in your vein. <laughs> tomato <laughs> sauce was the key <laughs> in making a good pizza in a sense in the dough. No, we used to have the... the a saying that the secret is in the uh, in the dough, right? In our in our, in our dough. So, uh, do, can you can you remember when it's sort of like, or maybe it's not even something that you're conscious of, but when does it begin to become part of your identity? When things started happening, uh, when things start coming together in life, you know, it's a never-ending process, as I say. You know, when the the cropland uh, started. Uh, it was a process. At first, like I said, I didn't know much about it. It took uh, the school of hard knocks, uh, which is expensive and time consuming, and, but you have to go through it. You know? uh, Nobody is born with knowledge. Uh, you have to acquire it. And in tobacco especially, tobacco teaches you because every year is different. Things behave differently. People do things differently and all that. So you have to adjust. And that knowledge takes time to acquire. You know? um, but it's a process probably uh, maybe five, six years ago, things really started coming together. It was a, a, a true learning process, but we're, I would say, in, in an extremely good position, uh, basically in the last three years, because of our crops, all that uh, we're putting into the tobacco. It starts with the land, like I explained to you, you know? The land is extremely important. It took a long time to put the land where we wanted it. Uh, the fermentation was there, but obviously the raw leaf is what begins the whole process. No? The factory is a never-ending process as well, to learn, to get good rollers, uh, to eliminate or minimize errors or things that can go wrong, to control the process, again, that is key to having success. Yeah. To yeah. your point, we were talking earlier about the fact that in, in the factory, every cigar is, is weighed before yeah. it goes into the product, which is something that I hadn't seen in any other factory. Yeah, when we blend, we weigh each component. Okay, here we do it in grams. And then the cigar is weighed by size. Right. So when we do a, a series, you know, of different sizes of the same blend, all those components go accordingly and the weight is taken in. If a tobacco range, uh, let's say, uh, moves 10% or 8%, one way or the other, even less grams or more grams, that tobacco will not be right. It won't be right from the construction end. You will have difficulty drawing or the construction will have holes or flaky, etc. So those grams are extremely important from that angle. But more importantly is the blend. If you have too much ligero, if you have too much seco versus the blend, it'll show right away. So that weight control also speaks to you in terms of uh, this is not right. Uh, from the controlling aspect, each bonchero has that weight. So when he makes the bunch, he has to weigh it, okay? Because if it's not in that range, that cigar he won't be paid for. When the revisador goes through, he has weight with him. He checks the weight of every cigar. When he goes to the final control, again it's weighed, okay? Apart from the draw machine. We pay specific, very important attention to the weight. We have one customer, again, Dion. When that cigar goes to his store, I imagine him always in the counter there weighing the tobacco <laughs> to see if it's within that range. Dion's yes. over shaking his head, nodding so his head. Uh, yeah, I'm weighing them all. <laughs> and he gives me a call as well, no? uh, which is good. You know, He's the backstop. He's the last final control before he goes to the... Uh, so to us, weight is extremely important and very sensitive to it yeah. because it's uh, to us very uh, important in the control and in the quality of the final product. So just to give people who are listening to this a, a, a sense of where things are now, right? So we went through some of the, of, of the history and how we got here. Uh, and, and I don't know how much of this you're, you know, uh, wanna, how open you want to be about this stuff, but what can you tell people to give them a sense of where you are in the bigger picture of cigars in terms of the volume of on the farming side and, and volume out of the factory. Uh, okay. Uh, we're one of the largest growers in Nicaragua. We produced about 13,000 bales, which is a lot of tobacco. We plant a little bit over a thousand acres in the three regions, meaning Jalapa, 
Condega, and Esteli. And each we plant the both seeds, Criollo and Corojo. All that comes here, we ferment it, and basically almost 80, 85% we sell. 15% we keep for ourselves. So it comes into the factory, we do an aging process, okay? Time in tobacco is extremely important. Tobacco has to settle, has to fully express itself. It has to find its own way and it has to tell you when it's ready. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to that. So we have aging rooms where this great tobacco goes in and we keep it there. Intermarries, it takes time for it to settle within the paca, within the, uh, the bale, and then within the different bales in the room. Right. It, it's, it's closed, you know, because tobacco, for those that don't know, the good elements are very volatile. They fly away. That's why you have humidors. Right. You leave a tobacco outside, the good stuff will leave. And it won't come back. And the bad stuff, the resin, uh, the bad elements remain because they're heavier. So it's extremely important. That, and that's why in the store, the humidor is extremely important in your house to have a humidor. Apart from the humidity is that it stays within the confines of other cigars. And they intermarry, they interlace. Not that they transfer, you know, flavors or whatever, but aroma right. in the right conditions uh, remain. So that to us is, uh, you know, uh, extremely important. Yeah. And so in terms of the, the number of cigars that you're producing here. Yeah, we're producing here 20,000 cigars. We're not one of the huge factories. Uh, we're one of the largest growers that we are. But we're not one of the largest year. factories because we're boutique-ish. Uh, we aim to do things right, you know, and uh, not just produce massive cigars uh, and be out in the marketplace or produce every cigar we make, even for private label, we make sure it's a good cigar. And just for, for clarity for the person, because some, you know, some people listening to this might be novice smokers who don't have a good sense. That's 20,000 cigars every how often? Oh, every day, every day. Uh, now, Terrence Riley has come on board. Uh, heading marketing and sales in all that area. It's extremely important to us. We've always been labeled for many years as the sleeping giant in the sense that we have this great leaf, great capacity to produce it, yet we don't make that many cigars and we're not well known as others in the marketplace from the cigar premium side, no? Uh, but that's going to start changing. Sure. So speaking of change, let's uh, kind of uh, wrap up with... Um giving people some idea of where you see things going from here. What is, what are the next, I mean, I don't know what, how you, how, how your vision for the future looks, but let's say, I don't know, five, 10 years, or what is, what is the trajectory uh, for Casa Fernandez now, especially on the, on the okay, cigar our, side? Our trajectory is to keep growing, but always have the quality in mind. Okay. Not just produce quantity, produce great cigars. Padron taught me that as well, but it took him a long time. Uh, it's not just jump and start making 50,000 or 20,000 cigars. You have to have the people, okay? People are what makes things happen. And you have to have the leaf and the quality controls and consistency to make great cigars. It's just not produce cigars, period. It's produce great cigars year in, year out. Thanks to Eduardo for taking the time to do that interview and to all the people at Aganorsa for hosting me in Esteli. If you enjoyed that chat, you should check out the next issue of Cigar Snob Magazine for a story on Aganorsa tobacco and cigars. As always, thank you for listening to the Cigar Snob Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. Rate and review us while you're there. You can also find episodes of the podcast at cigarsnobmag.com slash podcast. Share this episode with friends and fellow smokers who you think might be interested in the story. If you're a social media person, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Cigar Snob Mag. Finally, make sure to send any feedback, questions, or comments to feedback at CigarSnobMag.com. We might just respond to you right here on the podcast or in the pages of Cigar Snob Magazine. Again, thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Nick Jimenez, and this is the Cigar Snob Podcast. At Cigar Snob Magazine, we know that man cannot live on water alone, which is why we keep a healthy stockpile of safra rum at the office. I'm Nick Jimenez, Senior Editor of Cigar Snob Magazine, and I'm here to tell you that every time we crack open a bottle of safra rum, we are impressed. In fact, I'm kind of hydrating with safra rum right now. It's unlike anything else, in part 
because of Safra's small batch approach. They use only hand cut sugarcane and process it into top grade molasses, distill in column stills, and ferment in a proprietary locally grown yeast. The rum master then ages the virgin rum in carefully selected bourbon oak casks. The end result is a rum masterpiece that's great for top shelf cocktails, drinking it on the rocks, or even just drinking it neat, which, by the way, is what we did when we paired this in the pages of Cigar Snob Magazine with the Oliva Serie B Melanio, but it goes great with just about any cigar. Here's what we had to say about Safra rum. Quote, the rum introduces smooth, honey, caramel, and molasses flavors that start to complement the coffee, chocolate, and spice from the cigar. Safra also received an exceptional 95-point rating from the Beverage Tasting Institute, so we are not the only ones who are crazy about this stuff. It's just another one of their prestigious awards. Ask for Safra Rum at your favorite retailer, restaurant, or bar. Make sure you follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Safra Rum. That's Z-A-F-R-A Rum. Safra Rum. Always drink responsibly, and remember that there is no rum without Safra.